This video is the advanced version of how to win Monopoly every time. We'll assume you already watched the first video and immediately move forward. If you haven't, the link to the video is in the description. First, this video is going to show why to buy these properties and not these properties. Then we'll go over the timing of trades to get yourself better deals. Then how to control the money supply and pigeonhole houses on your opponent. And finally, how to pull each and every strategy together to win the game with any property set. There's over 10,000 moving parts in this video, each done by hand, as well as decades worth of Monopoly knowledge made to make it the best Monopoly video possible. If you gain value from this video, give it a like, it helps YouTube algorithm, and write a comment about anything, YouTube likes that too. And if you wanna help the channel grow, hit subscribe. If this video brings in over 5,000 new subscribers, I'll make a new how to win video on whichever game is asked for most in the comments. First, let's look at why to buy some properties, but not others. We'll start by comparing the two best property sets, orange and red. Orange is roughly one roll past jail, the most likely spot on the board to land. Red is roughly two rolls. While rate of return is a good metric, we want to take into consideration the impact on a game. If we can make quick money, it not only helps our cause, but it also makes it more difficult for other players to buy or develop properties. So the speed in which you can develop your properties needs to also be taken into consideration. Now, back to red and orange. Assuming we pay sticker price for each property set, the oranges will cost $560 for all properties, $1460 for all with three houses, which is our sweet spot, and $2060 for hotels. Bear in mind, we start the game with $1500. For the reds, it will cost $680 for all properties, $2,030 for three houses, and $2,930 for hotels. Given that you start the game at $1,500, you should start to see where much of the problem lies and why speed of development is important. Hotels are a luxury and shouldn't be built until you have a firm grip on the lead, so we'll analyze the properties from the perspective of three houses. However, just for fun, for the same money, you can put hotels on orange and get a thousand rent, or three houses on red and get just 750 in rent. The reds in this case are actually more dangerous because they can still carry more houses and thus higher rent, but the main distinction here is in speed of development. If you start with 1500, where is the rest of your money going to come from? Most of it early on will just come from pass and go, which will take several turns. With just our initial money, we can top out at a return of 600 on New York Avenue or a return of just 300 on Illinois Avenue. The rent of $600 provides cash for six more houses on orange. The 300 only enough for two more houses on red. This dynamic is the beginning of pigeonholing houses, which essentially is binding your opponent into a catch 22, where if they don't buy houses, the properties can't do anything. But if they do buy houses, they're put in situations where they might have to sell them, which is a major no-no. This speed of development is important. So if we look at properties that have great speed, oranges can top at a $600 rent with your initial money. You can actually crack a fourth house on one of the pinks with a $700 rent because of property prices, though the positioning of orange is better. The light blues can top out with hotels for just $1070 with a hotel rent of $600. Their positioning before jail is a disadvantage, but with how quickly this can be developed can be a major advantage early in the game. Baltic can hit 450 with a hotel. It's cheap, but it doesn't pack much of a punch, and its position on the board makes it difficult to land on. It's generally better to use your money developing other properties. And then a property you probably weren't thinking about. Boardwalk. Yes, the most expensive property on the board is actually one of the cheapest to develop. With your initial cash, you can get a rent of $600 on Boardwalk. This is because Blue only has two properties to develop. The disadvantage to Blue is the odds are not particularly high to roll here. But if you get a $600 rent, you can afford three more houses, and rent is suddenly $1,400, which is going to give anyone a bad day if they land on it. Owning Blue in this capacity is risky but it's also why you shouldn't overlook these properties or simply let someone else own them without defending yourself. This speed of development plays a major factor in what you should buy and not buy. 
The yellows, and especially the greens, are very slow to develop. But rest assured, you do not want to land on these property sets if they have several houses. So, given these dynamics, brown is generally not worth it. Your money is more useful in buying houses elsewhere. Light blue is great if you get it very early, like less than passing go three times. Pink is likely the worst monopoly on the buy side. Its value comes if you can develop houses here while no one else can develop houses elsewhere. Since it's only three or four spots past jail, players usually roll right past it if they're getting out of jail. But you do have to keep tabs on the St. Charles Place card so that you don't get surprised. Orange is the best given the balance of cost to develop, rent prices, and also sits on the hottest area of the board. Red is also in a hot area of the board and has the Illinois Avenue Chance card, but as explained, the cost to develop is high, so if someone else gets houses first, you might find yourself stuck with one or two houses without the money needed to get to three. Yellow is just as expensive, but in a colder part of the board, meaning it'll take many laps around the board to develop these. Green is a colder, more expensive yellow. The only way to utilize green is in a very slow game where no one wants to trade and many laps around the board happen. The rent is so high here that if there aren't other houses to threaten you, you can inch house by house, collecting go money and rent with one or two houses until you reach three or more houses. This is very slow, but if you reach this point, these can become very scary. These just typically aren't worth the money unless if the game is very slow. Then, Blue utilizes two properties in the set to create massive rents, and the take a walk on the boardwalk card will take the wind out of anyone's sails. On their own, though, they can be frustrating because they're hard to land on, especially Park Place. So you can find yourself feeling very unlucky that no one is landing on your properties, and that all you need is one more rent to win and watch it just never happen. Which is why it's good to pair these with something like the railroads. The more players in a game, the more valuable the railroads become. This is twofold. One, there's more people to land on them. And two, there's more competition for the other monopolies, leading to a slower game where players have more cash. The railroads don't make you rich. They just keep others' money in check and siphon money to you to purchase houses with. They also make it more dangerous for others to buy houses, since if you have four railroads, Every single player's turn stands the risk of landing on a railroad and paying you $200. This makes them useful to have, but shouldn't be your main focus. Then, the utilities are just plain awful. Just pure hot garbage. They aren't even good for trades. In the last video, we discussed trades, but now we're going to look at the timing of trades. Your first few properties are random and are purely luck. Your next few properties are skill. Consider ease of trade. Trading for the first orange won't be that hard because it's not very powerful. Second orange will be harder, but not quite end of the world. Then the third orange will fight you tooth and nail and want the farm. It'll make sense to anticipate which properties you might later want. If you hold one orange, you might want to trade now in the hopes you land on the third one because you're not getting it later. Or if you have another player with good odds at landing on their second orange and you're playing with AI, you might want to make a defensive trade now because the AI in Monopoly is not smart at all. It's also important to keep an eye on the money supply. The amount of players you have will affect this. If you have three players, there's $4,500 in starting cash. If there are six players, there's 9,000 in starting cash. The timing of your trades can play a big factor in the money supply. For example, let's play out the defensive trade from the first video. Your opponent isn't happy you stopped him from completing his monopoly. But now, the game has changed. Everyone is poor, you ended up with the yellows with one house already, but don't have money to do much. Here's a scenario where you can use the money supply to hijack the game. Out of the kindness of your heart, you trade St. James Place for $300 in b and Railroad. This allows you cash to reach two houses, and the opponent doesn't have much ability to develop the oranges. You are actually dumping a good property on dog on purpose. 
First, it allows you to get the money to make your monopoly dangerous, even if it's not the best one. Second, you're going to pigeonhole houses. You still need at least $150 more for another house, and your monopoly is in a colder part of the board. However, Dog can't build houses. Pass and go will give him $200, and rent with one house is only $80. Let's say Dog is lucky, passes your properties three separate times in a row, and collects go three times. Putting it all on houses gets him a rent of $220. Your rent is still $3.30. Luck can only last so long. So on the fourth pass, Dog finally lands on yellow. Dog needs to get that money from somewhere. To acquire $300, Dog would have to sell all six houses, setting them back to the start. You can set other players in this loop by withholding properties they want and then dumping them on them when the time is right. If Dog doesn't buy those houses, then you have nothing to worry about. And if he does buy them, then he's taking a large risk. This example is with yellows, and the trade in the previous video is with pinks for a reason. You can win with every property set. All you have to do is either strike quick with a fast monopoly or defend the game long enough to win the game with a slow monopoly. If you're striking with a quick monopoly, you wanna get it up quick so you can start collecting high rents quickly to control the money supply. Or if you're working with a slow monopoly, Make defensive trades to eliminate competition. Remember your odds of dice probability, and make moves like buying houses when your opponents are close, or if you're going to dump a property like orange on your opponent, maybe pass that color set first before you do it. You won't want to do a property dump if you have a light hitting property set like brown, or a low likelihood set like blue, because if that player gets rent and go money, they can start to take back control. But with heavy hitters, you can still win every time with the worst monopoly. The secret is in the money supply. This video was an incredible undertaking, and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. It was many late nights, and I made both videos as short as I could while trying to leave no stone unturned. I hope by watching this video and the one before it, you'll become unstoppable in Monopoly. That is, if you can get anyone to play with you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time watching this video, and I can't wait to find out which game is asked for most in the comments.